I'm going to talk to you today about the shear wave velocity of liquefi liquefiable soils. And um, it's very much germane to Vancouver's Fraser River Delta's circumstances. And so lots of great work has been done here to map and to characterize liquefaction susceptibility and to do risk analyses. So I want to show you uh, the study that we've done and in part to take you from my experience as uh, a graduate student way back a long time ago at Berkeley and actually I was a scientist at the USGS but I started working at the USGS at 22 years of age at right after undergrad so I was 40 years so I quit. Time to retire after 40 years of that. Um, and so that whole time, really we learned about things in a very deterministic way. We analyzed problems in a deterministic way, especially liquefaction. And much of this project is this jump that we're all making. And that's a jump to uncertainty characterization, probabilistic analyses, looking at reliability indices as a way to better understand and control your project. So I'm at the um, UC Berkeley now and I'm teaching classes in engineering geology and geomatics. Uh, but this talk is really about geophysics. It's about, you know, a third field. And so I, I'm not a normal traditional civil engineer pile driving person who's had lots of experience doing that. The, my experiences are much more science based from the USGS and much more focused on the earth science and geophysics and geomatics elements that we can bring into civil engineering to better understand our projects. Okay, so the outline of the talk today is a discussion of probabilistic analyses using shear wave velocity to characterize this problem. So the first thing we'll do is we'll talk briefly, and this is a geotechnical group, so we can do it pretty quickly, is talk about the ways that we analyze these problems with the SPT and the CPT, and what those triggering relationships look like uh, in a probabilistic sense. Historically, there have been limitations in the way that we characterize sites with shear wave velocity for the purposes of liquefaction assessment. It turns out that there's this mismatch between where the data was and where the liquefaction sites were. And so they weren't overlapping one another. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about a long journey that has been two decades in the making, which was to try to fill that hole, the mismatch between the locations of liquefaction sites and where we have shear wave velocities to try to correct that. We'll talk about Bayesian updating and system reliability models for liquefaction probability assessment why it's important to understand model uncertainty. And finally, I'll show you some of the new data that's mostly from New Zealand, from the Darfield and the Christchurch events, and also data from the Tohoku earthquake that have greatly expanded our data set. So the idea was that we would have 650 or so odd sites, but we've decided to cast away two aftershocks from New Zealand, and it's actually brought our numbers down to about a little over 560 sites that are going to be in the 2023 correlation. Okay, so once again, liquefaction, every, we all know this, but we must just state it up front what our definition is of what liquefaction is. So it's this transient state of elevated poor water pressure that negates effective overburden stress. We reach a RU of approximately 1.0 and the soil loses its brittleness, it can flow, it can behave badly in large strains. Globally, we see this happening at sites uh, where we have young, saturated, loose near surface deposits, either in coastal sands and gravels and silts, marine deposits that are typically, typically in the mid shelf region that are often clean sands, the water depth typically of uh, sewage outfall in the offshore is typically laid on top of relatively clean sands that are being swept by uh, marine currents. Aeolian deposits, alluvial deposits, and fluvial sand 
and silt deposits. And of course we know when humans place deposits, we do a bad job. And unless we adequately compact those sediment, we end up having a liquefaction problem. The image on the lower right is studied by uh, Simon Fraser University, so some of the great work that's come out of the engineering geology group there and the earth science group to try to understand zones of low, medium, high susceptibility to soil liquefaction. And the image in the upper right is actually from a BLAST experiment we did at Treasure Island in the San Francisco Bay Area where we induced liquefaction with blasting, then characterized the ground. Okay, so this is the traditional way that we've approached this problem, either with a standard penetration test device or a cone penetration device. And in these models, and some of the earliest models, you can think of Harry Seed characterizing these problems in a very deterministic way of seismic demand characterized as a cyclic stress ratio plotted against soil capacity. And Professor Seed didn't characterize anything probabilistically. He drew a line and the whole industry followed that line and that was the way it was and if you if you some of us are old enough to have been students of harry seed and uh he you know he had this commanding presence that basically if he said this is the line you followed that line um since then we've crossed into a probabilistic realm and so these are some of the first relationships that have expressed this problem this way that have gone beyond logistic regressions that are actually incorporating the distributions of all the parameters. And they are under Chetton, Chetton et al. relationships from 2004, looking at cyclic stress ratio, again, normalized as we normally do to magnitude 7.5 and one TSF, and N160 clean sand in the x-axis in the middle plot. And this has just been updated in 2018 and there's a new relationship there that adjusts these curves, but not dramatically. And it addresses a lot of the concerns of some of the debates that were happening in the preceding decade. The third plot on the right is the seismic cone penetration test. And this is Rob Moss's characterization in probabilistic terms in Moss et al, 2006, of those bounds of cyclic stress ratio plotted against QC1. Okay, so why would we approach this problem having those good tools in our toolbox? Why would we approach this problem with a shear wave velocity measurement? So one of the interesting things about liquefaction, although we think of it as this large strain problem, it actually from the standpoint of poor water pressure generation is a low strain problem. And some of the earliest work that was done on this is Ricardo Dobry's work in 1979 and 1982, looking at threshold strains at which you start to see a positive RU climbing up towards one. And he found, depending on the soil, at something like five times 10 to the minus three or one times 10 to the minus two, depending on the soil mixtures, the pool water pressures rise up and you can reach high values of an RU of 0 0.8 and so on before you get to 1% strain. So if we can characterize the soil with the shear wave velocity with a slow strain measurement, it actually serves the purpose of telling us whether we are in a highly susceptible, moderately susceptible, non-susceptible kind of deposit. So that was Dovery's work and it's quite good valid work. And then many years later, uh, Ada athanasopoulos Zekos, who's at Berkeley now, uh, pro published a paper in 2017 showing the relationship between the shear wave velocity measured in laboratory tests plotted against the peak shear resistance of the soil and the shear resistance at phase transformation on its decline to full liquefaction and found very good relationships, obviously for the peak strength, degrading relationships, but still good for phase transformation. But if you wanted to use shear wave velocity to characterize a large strain problem, it wasn't very good. So shear wave velocity has its role in understanding seismic liquefaction triggering, but it's not a good 
tool for looking at residual large strain values of strength or resistance. So in this talk, when we talk about liquefaction, we're talking about seismic soil liquefaction triggering the initial rise of pore water pressures up to an RU of one, after which another parameter needs to take its place to characterize the problem. Okay, what we do in the laboratory and what was shown with Dobry is really kind of what we do in the field when we do field measurements. So there we calculate a cyclic stress and we, that's the acceleration of the ground times the total stress of the uh, mass that's being accelerated. And uh, we reduce these factors with an R sub D and other parameters developed by Harry C, duration weighting factors and such. But still, we're still calculating a shear stress and we normalize it by the effective stress. And we do the same thing with our measurement of shear wave velocity. We measure our shear wave velocity in the field and we also normalize that by effective stress. And really what that's doing is the same thing as what's happening in the laboratory, which is we have data that's being generated under a different regime of effective stresses. And by normalizing them, we can plot them all on the same plot and make those same comparisons. So that's why we see this effective stress normalization is it's quite powerful. We know for certain parameters that uh, were developed by in the early days by Harry C, they're still quite relevant and important right now. So we have, for example, a depth of reduction factor, R sub D. And uh, that is accounting for the reduction in the acceleration of the ground motion at depth in the soil layer, even though the shear stress is increasing, the accelerations are decreasing. So these two factors are working against one another, and we have to reduce the overall shear stress by this R sub D factor. And so the, the equation on the bottom is Andre Chetton's very long and lengthy equation in 2004, but actually I'll tell you a secret about it. There's only one thing different between the numerator and the denominator, and I've circled it. It's just the depth parameter there. So um, if some, we're all geotechnical engineers, so at, at varying degrees, everyone here likes equations, but only to a point. And uh, so if you don't like the equation, I'll try to talk you through it. And here's one example where th something looks very intimidating. And really, when you get down to it, it's a curve fit exercise to basically follow the average R sub D. The other thing you see in, the, in this, and I don't know if this is going to work or not, uh, but you see that there's an un uncertainty element of it, too. There's a sigma on the end. So in all of the probabilistic analyses, you're going to see not just the characterization of the mean expected response, but you're also going to see for every single parameter a characterization of the uncertainty. And then ultimately, we're going to calculate an overall model error based on the ratio of, well, basically the coefficient of variation, the relationship of the standard deviation to the mean. Okay. Shear wave velocity, I hope I haven't convinced you that it, it works yet. You've got to see some data to believe that it's going to work. But let's at least talk about what's good about it and what clearly isn't good about it. One thing that's good about it is, unlike N160 and QC1, it actually means something, right? <laughs> it's not a hammer blows on the top of a drill stem. It's actually a fundamental geotechnical property that we're using to characterize the problem. So as geotechnical engineers, that's a good thing. We like that, right? It has strong connections to critical state and to engineering mechanics through the relationship between the shear modulus density and the shear wave velocity. We can measure it in all earth materials. So we can't get that standard penetration sampler into everything around here, and certainly not the cone penetration uh, apparatus, although there have been great advances to try to find a way to do that, have sacrificial, sacrificial tips to bang your way through gravels, extract it, and bring back the instrumented sensors and things like that. People are trying to find their way to get through difficult soils, but one thing for sure, especially with surface wave tests, we can test everything. And not only can we test everything in the field, including the rock beneath the liquefiable soil. We can also test it in the laboratory. We can achieve the same kind of result in both settings. And we can't do that with these penetration tests. 
So those are all the good things, but here's the bad thing. Here's the bad news. We don't have a sample. For these other methodologies, either we directly get a sample or we get some proxy for that sample, like I sub C and some cone penetration characteristic. So we don't know what we're testing. It's important when you're using the shear wave velocity to not do it independent of a borehole or do it independent of an SBT test or a CP test, something that's telling you the stratigraphy. You have to know the stratigraphy by some other method. That's a fundamental limitation of this approach. If you're going to use shear wave velocity, you've got to know what you're doing. Usually the drillers won't be doing this for you. You have to show up and multi-channel assessment of surface waves, spectral analysis of surface waves, frequency wave number, ambient vibrations. These are not black box techniques. You actually have to do them a lot, know what you're doing, know what the pitfalls are, know when you you're in the range to get good data, when you're doing the test inappropriately for the site that you're on. It's a small strain ver measurement, so it's actually being measured at strains below the threshold, pore water pressure elevation 0 0.02 or 0 0.01 of, of Dobry. So we're making measurements at 10 to the minus 4. So we'd like to see some data to convince ourselves that this is going to work. And then finally, and I, again, I've got 550 sites to show you, but I promise you, we'll, it'll all happen before 7.30. Um, in those 550 sites, the total range of liquefiable soils that have shear wave velocities is 85 to 230 meters per second. That is a much narrower range than an N160 that can go from one or two or three to 30 in the liquefiable range. So maybe one of the limitations of the shear wave velocity is we're seeing this constrained range at which liquefiable soils happen in shear wave velocity space. That could be viewed as a detriment. Anyway, um, my, first, my first exposure to this I was a 20-something year old student at Berkeley, 29, I think, and, uh, and Loma Prieta earthquake had just happened. My advisor was Jim Mitchell, and Jim Mitchell, Dick Campanella, who worked so much on the cone penetration test here in Vancouver at UBC, he was one of Jim Mitchell's first students, and I was one of Jim Mitchell's last students at Berkeley, so kind of weirdly liquefaction sort of bookends Jim Mitchell's career in, and his time at Berkeley. And uh, when I was a student there, I was just, you know, learning like all students, trying to figure out how to survive. And I was told after the Loma Prater earthquake, where we were testing SPT, CPT, and dilatometer tests, I was told by Fre Professor Mitchell and Ray Seed, oh, Professor Tokimatsu is coming from Tokyo Institute of Technology, and uh, your job is to get him into every site he needs to go to and learn everything you can and help him. And this is like one of those serendipitous things that's happened to every one of us in this room. Like someone came along and, you know, sh shined the light for you. Well, Professor Tokimatsu did it for me because we were going to sites on the left, like the Marina Green of San Francisco. And instead of spending $30,000 to drill a hole, case a hole, make our measurements, get an SPT, get a CPT, push a dilatometer, huge budget for this effort to go to maybe a dozen and a half sites, he showed up and he put some one hertz sensors on the ground without an active source and he collected a deeper shear wave velocity profile than any of us were characterizing with any of our tools. Anyway, it was quite remarkable. And, and I, Koji Tokimatsu and I have worked together now for 30 years since then. And it's one of those serendipitous things that comes along and it sort of changes the way you view practice. And so what he taught me was, wow, if we can make measurements of shear wave velocity by variety of methods, but in particular, 
spectral analysis of surface waves by all the various means by which we do that. We can show up at a site. It'll cost you nothing but your equipment to show up there. It's non-invasive. We're not sticking anything in the ground. We're inverting a shear wave velocity from the dispersion of surface waves. It's reliable if we make those measurements 10 times on liquefiable soils. We have a very narrow range of uncertainty in our parameters. It's a reliable test. And the most important thing is you don't have to ask anyone for a permit. You just show up with your equipment. You put it on the surface. Someone will come and ask you what you're doing. You just say, I'm having a picnic <laughs> with seismic sensors. You know? Okay, so this is what some of those early correlations look like. So Peter Robertson, uh, Peter Robertson had the first really kind of useful correlation. Amazing, Peter's such a bright guy. He somehow figured out, he got a pretty good curve when you think about what's happened in the following three decades. With five sites, he drew a line. That's a, this is what people did back then, okay? It was that. <laughs> That wonky. You'd never get away with this. Out. In your job, you'd probably be fired if you did that today. But people were publishing papers to saying, well, we got five sites. Let's draw a line. And that's Peter's. And it, he, he, was, he did a really good job. And then I told you about our Loma Prieta studies. And they, they were parts of our PhD dissertations, blah, blah, blah. And so Angela Lodge, I worked with her. She published her curve in 1994, and I published mine in 1992, she did a much better job than me now in retrospect. She was really, even with only those 20 points, she did a pretty good job. And the first group that really tried to develop a comprehensive understanding across many sites, a literature study, not by measurements that they went out and did per se, was Anderson Stokey. And Anderson Stokey collected a lot of data at U.S. sites for Bora Peak, for the Westmoreland earthquake, Elmore Ranch, Superstition Hills earthquakes in California, a few sites from Loma Prieta, and then the rest of their literature, and those were Ken Stokey SASW sites. So basically the professor was giving the data to the student to generate this correlation. And the literature sites were, uh, oh, for there are many reasons, to, uh, there weren't many of them. I'll just leave it at that. And they, some of them were in Taiwan, where basically liquefaction didn't happen at all, but like 30 of their sites are the same site getting hit once and over and over again by a small earthquake that doesn't cause any problem. Right? So there's a lot of data in there that was problematic. But nevertheless, that was their first, that was the first relationship. And that first relationship is on the right. And it was really a good effort to try to build something like a global catalog. Okay, next bit of serendipity that came along is I'd already finished, but I had done a lot of work developing case histories for soil liquefaction. And so two co-advisors of students, Armand de Corregian and Ray Seed, had two new students. Ander Chetton and Rob Moss. And they asked me, oh, could I come and be on their basically advising committees to help them develop these case histories? Well, they were doing something really different from us. What they were doing was characterizing these problems based on Armand de Corregian's system reliability tools and Bayesian updating. And this was casting these problems no longer as a solid line magnitude 7.7 .7, and we move it back and forth based on the magnitude scaling factor but now for every condition we have probabilistic bounds and it was it was like a, another one of these things it sort of happens in your career and you see it and you realize oh my gosh this is like this is incredibly powerful and I, you know we talk about Har Harry Seed and Jim Mitchell Leismer so on. But if you want to know who was the real wizard behind the curtain, Wizard of Oz, it was Armand de Corregian. That guy was brilliant. You meet someone like him once or twice in your life, and they change your life, right? And Armand did for all of us, everyone here. He got us to think about everything in uncertainty terms, everything probabilistically. There wasn't a 
deterministic bone left in our bodies after we had been beaten up by Armin. So you take his classes and you, and you work with him and you realize this is it. This is fantastic. So what were these two young students doing? They were doing in the old pre-PDF days of the 1990s. They were building these catalogs. They looked like telephone books. Literally, it was just like a paper accounting job of here's the SPT site, here's its location, here are its parameters, here's our best estimate of the cyclic stress ratio and of its penetration resistance. So Ander Chetton, he took care of the SPT catalogs. And Rob Moss, he took care of the CBT catalogs and each generated these huge, huge volumes. And when you look through these volumes and you had an eye, as I did, on shear wave velocity, you saw this problem, this glaring hole. There were all these sites, especially in Japan, Taiwan, China, that were not represented at all in the shear wave velocity space. So created an opportunity. So that was the problem. What did Ander and Rob do? Well, they did everything. They figured out where the site was. They had the maps of the sites, the reconnaissance reports, the SPT values, the fines content, the cone penetration resistance, the total stress, the effective stress, the peak acceleration, the depth of reduction factor, the magnitude scaling factor. They had done everything. And so this was my plan after advising those two was like, ooh, I am going to catch the next plane to Japan and my job is to go to as many of these sites as I can possibly go to, because they've done everything. The one thing that's missing is a shear wave velocity. So let's go back to those sites. And if the sites had not been improved and had not been changed, let's make a shear wave velocity measurement and cast it in the same probabilistic framework that you saw for the SPT and the CPT. And these are the relationships from 2013 that do that. So that's what we did. Basically loaded up a bunch of gear. I took a sabbatical from the USGS for one year and in 2001 to 2001, and then subsequently for every year until the pandemic, was back in Japan collecting data. So two decade effort to do this data collection. And of this data collection, we've characterized over a thousand sites using surface wave methods, but 460 of them passed a vetting process to characterize that the uncertainties are acceptable to be in part of this liquefaction catalog. And, um, and these sites reside on previously tested SBT, CPT, or soil boring sites. So all of our sites were revisiting, basically revisiting data sets that have been characterized in another way. So we already know what the critical layer is. We already know a lot of the characteristics from the liquefaction that occurred at that site, or maybe it's a non-liquefaction site. And then we still have 91 sites that are coming from the literature. So we mix these two, and this also creates another bit of a problem, which is what happens when you have a liquefaction correlation and one person has collected all the data? That's not really great, right? It wasn't great for Andrus and Stokey because 90% of their data, not 90, 80% of their data was Stokey data, right? So for this correlation, certainly something on the order of two thirds of it at least or more, more, we've characterized. So that's a problem. Anyway, here's one example. Here, first off, you can see a map of the world. And you can see, wow, where's all the liquefaction happening? Where are all those documented spaces of liquefaction? Japan, by and large. If you miss Japan, you miss, you know, you miss the story in soil liquefaction because out of those 256 sites, super high cyclic stress ratios, super dense sites, loose sites, low acceleration sites, the whole band of the case histories are represented in Japan. You could do this whole analysis just in Japan, right? And Japan, of course, has earthquakes at a hot, much higher frequency than us. The recurrence rates are lower. So as a result, wow, you're back in Japan every year or two looking at another dozen sites, 
Other sites are coming from China, Taiwan. We now have a huge number of, of sites that are coming from Christchurch, New Zealand. I, we thought it was going to be 128, but we threw away two aftershocks because they weren't really telling us anything because they were below the values and outside of the range that was causing liquefaction. So we just neglected two of the four Christchurch events. And here's one of the examples of a site that we've tested. So you've all seen this picture. It's in the front of Kramer's book and so on, and geotechnical earthquake engineering. And it's the Niigata liquefaction sites. And this is actually in the Hakusan area of Kawagishicho in Niigata City. And if you go there, you'll find that those buildings have all been torn down, as they should be, right? They perform pretty well. They didn't collapse. Not a single building collapsed. They just rolled over. So pretty stout buildings, pretty well built, but not the best foundations. But if you go there today, you can go to a site that hasn't been approved, like the Hakuzan School, which is right next to where those apartments are. And I'll lay out my equipment, and I'll measure the velocity of the ground. And that's one site. That's one of these 460 sites that we've collected in the data set. So all these sites are waiting for us. And I'm just giving you some examples of them. So these are, two, these are sites. The one on the left is up in uh, near Sapporo. It was shaken by the 1968 Tokachi Kenoki magnitude 8 earthquake. And then got shaken again by the 2003 Tokachi Kenoki offshore Tokachi earthquake. And in one case, liquefaction happened. And in another case, with lower accelerations, didn't happen. Nice bracketing at the same site, spaced apart by 40 years of time. Sites in Luxori, Japan, so an earthquake that happened very recently. So instead of it being site 96 or 41, it's site 992. So that's, we're just sequentially going through our sites. And you can see one difference in the test is the test on the left has four sensors and a center source. And the test on the right is a multi-channel test with um, 16 channels laid out and the source is a hammer source, which I don't really like and I'll tell you why I don't like it in a minute. But when you're traveling, sometimes you just got to use the equipment that's available for you. Okay, some of the things that have happened in the field have led to some very unusual commutes to the job site. So um, for the Denali Fault earthquake sites, we had to helicopter into sites that Professor Sitar who used to teach here, he and I were in an airplane looking over liquefaction sites after 2002, and we identified the sites, and then we were there the next year with a helicopter, and basically we had augering equipment, we had batteries, we had all our surface wave equipment on our backs, and rifles, shotguns for bear, and all sorts of things. You were in Alaska, your USGS wouldn't allow me to be in the field without something that I could stop a bear with. So we're in the field and we're marching along to the next site and testing. So that's on the left. On the right, the earthquake from Tangshan in 1976, disastrous earthquake. We've revisited that data set with surface wave tests and then we've revisited it again with cone penetration test and a uh, really fascinating, fascinating time to be in rural part of China doing this testing. And up in the middle for the Kobe earthquake in 90, 1995, um, part spurs of the JR railway that weren't used during the day, they gave us our little train and we can load all our equipment on our little train and push it along to sites that we were gonna test that had already been tested before. So those are kind of the examples. So um, how do we go from surface waves to shear wave velocity? Um, some of you, how many of you do spectral analysis, surface waves, or MASW, FK? A few hands, all right? So, right? so um, the, you know we could talk about this for weeks, and we do in class. So I'm going to try to do it in two minutes. But just accept as a matter of faith that there's a lot more to it but I'm gonna give you the nuts and bolts of it in two minutes. We go out to the site and we have, uh, we have over here, I can't really, I'll just show it over here. We have our sensors and we have a central source. So a lot of people use hammers. I don't like hammers. This is a vibrating shaker and that's the test component. And from it, we calculate 
the linear spectra, and when you calculate FFT spectra, you get a real and an imaginary part, from which we can calculate a cross-power spectra. So that's number two. The equation for the cross-power spectra is up above in the upper right, and that will give us a wrapped phase. It tells us how out of phase the waves are between our various sensors. And if we know the separation of the sensors, how much of that out of phase is actually the wavelength, right? It's a trick to give us a wavelength. So we can unwrap this and we can get an unwrapped phase. And it turns out that if you want to calculate what that phase is, it's the arc tangent of the imaginary part of the cross power spectra to the real part. So you just get these data sets and you calculate that. And in the field, we, we're calculating a wrapped phase. We don't have to come back to the lab and do that. We capture this data in the field. The velocity is always the frequency times the wavelength. And so here now, we just have to characterize what is, what is that wavelength. And the wavelength is dependent on the separation of the sensors, d2 and d1, times 2 pi over theta in radians, so 2 pi, or you could do it in degrees to calculate it. Anyway, that's what gives us this thing called a dispersion curve. And a dispersion curve just tells us how the Rayleigh waves change as a function of, well, you could plot it two ways, as a function of wavelength or as a function of frequency. You could just flip. Dispersion curves can be presented in both ways. And the last step, the fourth step, is an inversion of a shear wave velocity. And uh, one does that with the Rayleigh equation that links together P waves, S waves, Poisson ratio, and Rayleigh waves. So if you have those characteristics of the dispersion curve, which is the Rayleigh wave, and the Poisson ratio, you can back out the P wave and the S wave. So there's lots of ways to do this, and we could talk about it a long time, but that's it. Any quick questions about that before we move on? Because the test is coming. You're going to get quizzed in 10 minutes. Anyway, I, I just want to tell you through the steps here, though. I just, I'm sorry I'm going to step away from your mic. Uh, but here's the dispersion curve presented in wavelength. Here it is again presented against frequency. The way we calculate a shear wave velocity is to find the theoretical dispersion curve based on the inversion that best matches the field data. So you see a magenta line on the here, and that's the field data. And then the purple line or the blue line is the theoretical dispersion curve that gives us this profile right here. And this magenta line is just our VS30. It's nothing, right? That's sort of, that's what we average based on this measurement. Okay, I told you I don't like hammers. And one of the reasons why I don't like hammers is you hit the ground and you get whatever frequency you generate. Broad spectrum. Maybe they're not even in the frequencies you care about. Maybe you care about 1 hertz to 20 hertz. When you hit the ground, you're getting 15 hertz to 100 hertz. You hear it, right? So we use electromechanical shakers and a thing called a handing window, which is basically low pass, high pass filter. You pass through the wave of interest. You pass through everything. And the, the high pass and the low pass filter create a notch and we only get the frequency of interest from which we calculate the phase of it. And we do this for one frequency, 10 hertz, and then we might do it again for 10 hertz, and do it again for 9 hertz, and go all the way in the range of interest for us. So these are two shakers and they're working together. And the reason why we're doing this is Unlike using a hammer source, we can get a 40 decibel boost. Decibels are a lot of scale, so it's an enormous boost in signal quality if we use a vibrating shaker. So we use this technique so we can get the best quality of this version we can. At the USGS, Earthquake has improved on this equipment now, but basically it's not a way to get it into these systems and get them into a frame that would have the same penetration. Basically, four legs come down, this is a trailer, the wheel, and then these electromagnetic filters just through the frame into the ground. 
this is a way to physically work like the rock and 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 rock Okay, so this is the end result of going to those thousand sites of which 460 make it into the database. We had 92 or 91 sites that are from the literature and we plot them up. And so what you're seeing, the black dots represent liquefaction happened there, the open circles, liquefaction didn't happen there. And then everything in between those boundary curves they fall out of this Bayesian probabilistic analysis and reliability methods. And the way we do that is we cast a limit state function. And that function, you could make any function you want. We, poor Rob Moss, I drove him crazy. We made 18 of them and we chose ultimately the one that gave us the lowest model error. So here's the limit state function and it has all these parameters you expect to see in a model. VS1, the shear wave velocity, the cyclic stress ratio, the magnitude of the earthquake, the effective stress, the fines content, the model error, epsilon. We don't have total stress in there because total stress and effective stress are correlated. So we want uncorrelated parameters in here. We say that if the model tips negative, we're on the liquefaction side of the 50% probability boundary. We say, we're leaning in that direction as opposed to being positive and leaning in the other direction. This is if the shear wave velocity is a positive parameter and has a positive theta, these coefficients. So the thetas are all coefficients. And if they're positive for VS1, then the cyclic stress ratio has to be negative because that's the higher the cyclic stress ratio, cyclic stress ratio, it's, go, it's gonna pull down that limit state function. And so these are the equations that fall out of it. So the first one is the probability of liquefaction expressed as the cumulative norm distribution function of these parameters. And we can calculate the cyclic resistance ratio basically by inverting this equation above it. And that's what allows us to cast these probabilistic curves in terms of 5, 15, 50%, 85%, 95%. The system reliability part of it is the norm cumulative distribution function characterization that leads to, to these two equations. And the Bayesian updating part is finding the right thetas that fit in the uh, limit state function. So we see these plots, and these plots make you feel like we got great confidence in our data. Ooh, that's a solid black point right there, and that's its value, right? That's not the way you should look at these data. And I think this is the way you should look at these data, which is when you see a black dot that represents liquefaction or an open dot representing non-liquefaction, it really represents the mean value of an uncertainty distribution in cyclic stress ratio or in shear wave velocity or in SPT or CPT or any other parameter space. So really what we have are uncertainty clouds and the degree to which we have a smaller uncertainty cloud, the more influence that has on the overall boundary position of the boundary curves. A site with high uncertainty has very little pull on the boundary relationship. That's one of the benefits that we see coming out of the probabilistic analyses and some of Armin de Kregian's tools. So how for reliability analyses would we use these relationships, these probabilistic boundaries? So I've made it a simple plot that's sort of a, a Suzanne Lacoste kind of way of thinking about things, which is we want to characterize some sort of design event and you have your site and your site has certain characteristics in terms of its shear wave velocity or SPT values or CPT values. And so we want to contrast the seismic demand against soil capacity uh, based on that design event. So here, for example, you might say marine container yard 
Fraser River Delta. We are estimating a cyclic stress ratio for a certain, I just made this up, so you probably know that it's a much higher number than this. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but anyway, I just made it up. In fact, I shouldn't have even said Fraser River. At some place on the planet Earth, this is our design 10% in 50 year event, and we have a mean value of acceleration, and so based on our parameters, you could, you could say, oh, the cyclic stress ratio is gonna be this but you know all the uncertainties in that analysis, and you'd actually also want to come up with a sigma and a coefficient of variation. And that would express, for example, a probability distribution or density function for that cyclic stress ratio. And then you would compare it with what? You'd compare it with the probability density function for liquefaction. And the way you would read that is you would come up from wherever your site condition is, crossing these boundaries, and you can get a probability density function for the liquefaction response, and you can compare them. And when you compare them, you find that in some cases you're going to have an overlap, which means you have some probability that liquefaction is going to occur. Obviously, if your whole distribution of cyclic stress ratio is bigger than your soil capacity, you're in trouble, right? Everything's going to be black here in the plot on the right. But you can adjust your conditions by improving the site and seeing how much your site improvement leads to a reduction in the probability of liquefaction. Right? You might do more of an analysis on the seismic expectations for the site and find out that your cyclic stress ratio wasn't properly characterized. So you would need to look at all your parameters to try to best understand and best characterize as unbiased as you can the way that the load and demand are interacting with one another to calculate a probability of liquefaction. Okay, this is what our, our properties look like across the spectrum. So we have for Again, I told you, now it's 551 sites. Some of them are ours, some of them are other people's. The depth of the groundwater for all of these sites is approximately, on average, two meters. The thickness of the critical layer is, on average, not that thick, only about three meters. The center line of the critical layer, it's only five and a half meters or so. In other words, it's what you already know. Liquefaction is a shallow, young deposit problem with a high water table, full saturation. And then on the right is a plot of some of these other parameters like cyclic stress ratio. The average shear wave velocity for all these sites is 167. So it's right in the middle of our data set and so on. Okay, one of the interesting things that falls out of this analysis, and it's no big surprise, it's sort of consistent with laboratory work that had been done before, also with Andrus and Stokey, is that when we fix the other terms in our limit state function and analyze the fines content theta, or coefficient, we find it's a really small number. In other words, wow, the fines content really isn't aiding or isn't really detrimental in the shear wave velocity characterization of this problem. That's potentially a really useful thing. So if you have a site where you already know the stratigraphy, you already know based on borings, SBTs, CPTs, if you go out and do that analysis with shear wave velocity, you're not encumbered with these fines content correction factors that are adjusting your SBT values and your CPT values significantly. Right here, you don't have, you hardly make any adjustment at all for fines for the shear wave velocity test. And I would view that as a positive thing, but you could also view it as a negative thing and say, well, clearly you're not sensitive. You're not being sensitive to the fines content. But remember, for liquefaction triggering, it's a small strain problem. And so we're not so hung up on the fines con influence on the triggering, we see the fines, con fines content influence happening during penetration and the effect on penetration of our tools in the ground. So shear wave velocity nicely negates this problem. Okay, another nice thing that comes out of this is independent of other methods, we can calculate a magnitude scaling factor. 
based on these data set. And it turns out it's nice and it ought to make you feel kind of confident about these terms in liquefaction assessment models, is that uh, totally independent with shear wave velocity, we're getting a magnitude scaling factor that comes out of the limit state equation, basically that falls between seed and Idris for a very long time ago, 40 year, years ago. Um, Idris and Boulanger, Chetan et al., they all seem to be aligning themselves very nicely. The two NCR curves above aren't really in use much. So these other deeper analyses, NCR was like a consensus report uh, from a workshop. So these other correlations are actually from individual studies, and they're all pretty much agreeing with each other. And that, that ought to make us feel good about magnitude scaling factors. Okay, new data sets. We have really high cyclic stress ratio sites coming from the Miyagi uh, prefecture area of Japan. And we have lower uh, cyclic stress ratio sites that are coming from the Tokyo area affected by the Tohoku earthquake and also from the Christchurch, New Zealand events. And so these are the two main events that are contributing a lot of data. So in the Tokyo area, we have uh, lots of liquefaction happened in the Ryosu neighborhood, and we did a lot of characterization there, about 30 sites. Um, and then I had all the sites that I had previously tested for previous prior earthquakes up in Miyagi. So those, we already knew what the properties were, and they're up in the B area up above. So that's the Japan sites, and the New Zealand sites are from, basically there were four events, but again, I've said for three times now that we've pared it down to just the Darfield event, 7.1, and the Canterbury earthquake event of uh, 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 magnitude 6.2, 2011 event. And this is how these data fall out, and they're just sort of consistent with our other data sets. So they are, these are now being folded into this larger data set of 561 sites, and hopefully we'll have a paper, at least in draft and in review, uh, maybe by the summer. Okay, well, some of the new things that are happening in the correlations that differ from correlations from 2013 is we're now incorporating the natural logarithm of the shear wave velocity just to be balanced with the other terms. We're incorporating a magnitude scaling factor directly into our limit state equation. So in the second equation, you see the MW over magnitude 7.5. Beforehand, we had to do it outside. We calculated our, our thetas, and then outside, we'd fix the other parameters and determine what the magnitude scaling factor. Now it's just gonna fall right out of the analysis. And K sigma will also fall right out of the analysis. Here's another important thing about these data sets. We don't want to have too much weighted on one earthquake, and we don't want too much weighted on all the liquefaction sites, and we don't have that many non-liquefaction sites. So we have weighting factors to upweight and downweight whole data sets. So we have many more liquefaction sites, and we want them to have less influence than the non-liquefaction sites so that they're balanced in numbers. So we do a, a scaling to basically turn them into the equal number of points. And we do that with a weighting factor. So the weighting factor for the liquefaction points is 0 0.6. The weighting factor for the non-liquefaction sites is 1.4, scaling down and scaling up. If we don't have those weighting factors, the boundary curves hardly move. It's a minor statistical thing. We sort of arm in. The wizard behind the curtain tells us to do this. And like Harry Seed, we do it. So that's how it works with Armin. If you want to work with Armin, he, he knows what he's doing. Okay, so in conclusion, we have these standard penetration test and cone penetration test catalogs that were generated by Andre Chetan and Rob Moss. And wow, these things are just packed with Japan sites, Taiwan, China principally. And then we have the US sites, which are really the minority of the sites. But that wasn't where the shear wave velocities were. So we loaded up the bus and we took it on the road and we collected the data set where the data were. So we went to these sites and retested them for shear wave velocity and in some cases for cone penetration test as well. We had this uh, 
the spectral analysis of surface waves field campaign. At none of these sites did I drill a borehole or need a permit, or I couldn't imagine what it would be like to permit hundreds of sites in Japan to drill a hole and make measurements. I just showed up and I made measurements and I left. And occasionally someone asked me what I was doing. And that's how the data set was collected by and large. In some cases we needed to have permits because we were on private uh, property and so on. And so we got permission to do it. So these new case histories, most importantly, they reoccupy sites where we already know the stratigraphy, the geotechnical characteristics by SPT or the geotechnical aspects by CPT. So we're not guessing at what the parameters are on the ground. They've already been analyzed for those properties. We're just laying down the shear wave velocity parameter as the new parameter to add to these data sets. And we've cast them in probabilistic terms and system reliability methods per Armand de Kregian to develop these correlations that express the liquefaction susceptibility in terms of cyclic stress ratio, shear wave velocity, magnitude, effective stress, and fines content. And that's the talk.